Okay, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, this is the evening, Sunday, March the 11th, or 12th, the 13th, the 14th, don't care what day it is, uh, it should be the 12th, sorry, and on this March the 12th, in the evening on a Sunday, I'm going to have a conversation with some of you. Now, some people are going to be upset about the conversation. Some people are not going to believe the information discussed in the conversation. Some people are going to want to argue and say, that's not true. But again, the one thing I will not do is give you my opinion. I will not make up the information. I'm just going to show it to you. And then I'm going to show you something to back it up. And then I'm going to show you something to back that up. And then you're going to have to come to well, you won't be able to come to a conclusion because the conclusion will already be established by the evidence. Shall we get to it? Everywhere you go, you hear people talking about the black race, individuals of color. You hear them talking about where they started, how they should be, how they've been treated. What you all don't understand is that this is your proof that the Bible is authentic, that the scriptures are what they say they are. How so? Let's have a discussion. Now, you're going to have to stay for the whole discussion, and you're going to have to listen to the bringing forth the information regarding the whole discussion and not just walk away, because then you won't be able to put the pieces together. Again, this is proving a fact to be a fact and not supposition. Not just saying blah, 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 and then based on some book that some person wrote five years ago, no, this ain't like that. We're going to go back, pay attention, over 3,000 years. No, I don't want no update. Get off my computer. Give me one second, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to go to the book of Jude. Jude is the book just before the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation coming thereafter. So just go to Revelation, the first chapter, and then go back one page, and you'll be in Jude. Jude is only a couple of verses long. So with that being the case, Jude, if you want to know a little bit of history, Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. Yes, son of Mary and Joseph. Jude, Jesus' half-brother, wrote a letter. Here's what was written in his letter under inspiration. Although you, speaking to the congregation that he's writing to, are fully aware of all of this, I want to remind you that Jehovah, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those not showing faith. And the angels, what angels? Who did not keep their original position, what position did they have? Position in heaven. But forsook their proper dwelling, see, in heaven, place, he has reserved for eternal bonds of dense darkness for the judgment of the great day. Hmm. But that's not the point, because we have to talk about the origins of colored folk. Well, it is the point. Pay attention. We have to go back to a time to find out about manners. Let's find out about manners. In the same manner, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them. Wait, says in the same manner. All right, let's go back and find out what the manner is. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have to go back and find out when this manner thing took place. That takes us back to Genesis from the beginning. We have to go and we have to find out when these angels who did not keep their original place. So let's take a look at verse number one of chapter six of Genesis says, now when the men, when men, started to grow in number on the surface of the ground, and daughters were born to them, the sons of the true God, not men, these are angels, that's why it's referring to them as sons, with an S, of the true God, began to notice the daughters of men were beautiful. Ladies and gentlemen, they began to notice that the daughters of men were beautiful. If these were men noticing the daughters of men, then there would be no need to highlight the fact because there would be nothing wrong with that. But it says, so they began taking as wives all of whom they chose. <sighs> There's a problem here. 
there are some people who say that these are regular humans that begin to notice the daughters of men, which is not the case here. This is the beginning. Man were not called at the beginning in Genesis sons of the true God. They didn't get that title until much later. So let's go here. We're going to open up, we're going to extract all of the links. We have Job 1 6. Now the day came when the sons of the true God entered to take their station before Jehovah, and Satan also entered among them. So we're talking about spirit creatures, and it refers to them as sons of the true God. Then we go to Job 38 7. When the morning stars cried out joyfully together, or it's joyfully cried out together, and all the sons of God began shouting an applause. This was at the creation of the earth and the creation of man. So these sons of the true God are not man. And remember, these individuals are in heaven. They take their station before Jehovah. Why? Because Satan is there with them, and he is a spirit creature. Then we got Second Peter 2 verse 4. Certainly God did not refrain from punishing the angels who sinned, but threw them into Tartarus, putting them in chains of dense darkness to be reserved for judgment. That's what we learned about in Jude. And the angels who did not keep their original position but forsook their own proper dwelling place, he has reserved for eternal bonds and dense darkness for the judgment of the great day. So we know that Genesis is talking about, sorry, I hit my microphone. We know that Genesis is talking about the angels. And we have to do this to let you know that we're not using imagination, thoughts, our opinion. We're going to use the scriptures to prove the scriptures. Now, it says, so they began taking wives for themselves. Wait a minute, how could a spirit creature take wives for themselves? Well, they are more powerful than us. So these particular spirit creatures could create human bodies in which to inhabit. Basically, an avatar. That's what the movie Avatar is about. Where do you think they got the idea? I know, I know, I know. You're going to have to do your research on that, but go back and see where they got the idea. Now, it says, then Jehovah said, my spirit. Now, he's not talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about his spirit, his person, will not tolerate man indefinitely because he is only flesh. See, he's not referring to these men because these are angels. He's talking about man. Why? Because man began to do things as a result of this situation. So he says, accordingly, his days will amount to 120 years. Now, some people have been of the understanding, uh, he set a limit to how long man lives. 120 years old, 80 years old, 70 years old. No, it was 120 years from this date that he was saying he was going to bring about the destruction that's spoken of in verse 6. We are not going to refer to or talk about the events that took place 120 years later. We are only going to be discussing these sons of the true God forsaking their original place in heaven and doing this stupid stuff, having sex with the daughters of men. Why? Because when they had the sex with the daughters of men, it says the Nephinim were on the earth in those days. In what days? The days before the flood. But then it says, and afterwards. What it means is, after this pronouncement here. Why? How do we know that? It says, during that time, the sons of the true God continued to have relations with the daughters of men. And these bore sons to them. That's how we know it was during this time. And they are the mighty ones of old men of fame. See, not mighty ones of, you know, last year, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, the ones who lived over on the south side. No, mighty ones of old, meaning they've long since been gone. This is your Greek mythology. This is your, there's always some truth of mythology. But now we have a problem. Because remember, it says in like manner. Well, we haven't seen the manner because men marry and are given in marriage. Jesus even said that. So what's so significant about them noticing the daughters of men and marrying them? Now, of course, it was wrong for them to do it, but why was that so significant? Well, let's find out. We're going to go back to Genesis, the ninth chapter. This is, we, we just went to the sixth chapter, so we're going to go to the ninth chapter. 
because we just learned about how there was going to be a flood. He was angry because man had ruined the earth and had ruined its way on the earth. And so we go to Genesis, the ninth chapter, and we're going to travel all the way down to verse number 24. Well, we're going to start at 20. 24 is where we're going to get the understanding of what's going on. Now Noah started off as a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. When he drank of the wine, he became intoxicated. Yeah, he got drunk. And he uncovered himself inside his tent. Ham, Noah's middle son, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness, and he told his two brothers outside. Now, wait a minute. His father uncovered himself, went into his tent, and went to sleep because he was intoxicated. And it says, Ham saw, and he went and told his two brothers. Okay, what's the big deal? Let's find out. Let's see if there was a big deal. Let's see if there was a custom of that time that said that something was wrong here. So Shem and Japheth took a garment and they put it up on both their shoulders and they walked in backwards. Thus they covered their father's nakedness while their faces were turned away. And they did not see their father's nakedness. You see, so there was a problem. But this said Ham. The father of Canaan saw his father's nakedness. But notice this. When Noah woke up from his wine, he learned what his youngest son, well, Ham is the middle son. So this is not, it wasn't Ham who did something. It was Ham who saw his father's nakedness. Not, pay attention, Ham that did something. How do we know somebody did something? When Noah woke from his wine, he learned what his youngest son had done to him. So there was some type of physical contact because what he had done to him. And because he did this, this is what Noah, now remember, Noah was a prophet of God. He is the one who gave the prophecy that there was going to be a flood. He was the one whom it was revealed. He is the one to whom a covenant was made. Wait, hold on. Let's show you how important this Noah person is and god said to noah and to his sons with him i am now establishing my covenant with you and with your offspring after you and with every living creature that is with you so this is how important noah was it says and god added this is the sign of the covenant that i am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations so please understand what this man just did with reference to Canaan and Ham is important. So he says, cursed is Canaan or course be Canaan. Who is Canaan? Well, Canaan is the father of the Canaanites. That's who Canaan was. The Canaanite nations came from him. What nations are the Canaanite nations? These are the people of color. How do we know? Because Noah had three sons, my three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth. See, Japheth, Shem, and Ham. And because he had these three sons, the problem is Shem, the Caucasian race, comes from Shem. Japheth, the Asian race, comes from him. The persons of color come from Ham, and Canaan is the son of Ham. Cush, you've heard of people being called Cushites, is the grandson of Noah, the son of Canaan, or the great grandson, excuse me, the son of Canaan, the grandson of Ham. He says, Curse be Canaan, and let him become the lowest slave to his brothers. Wait a minute. Noah? prophesied that Canaan's offspring would be slaves? That can't be. Well, let's go ahead and let's do something. We're going to go to chapter 10, and we're going to go right here. Cush became father to Nimrod, 
he was the first to become a mighty one on the earth. He became a mighty hunter in opposition to Jehovah. That is why there's a saying, just like Nimrod, a mighty hunter in opposition to Jehovah. Interesting. Now we're going to go to 15. Canaan became father to Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, as well as the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgishites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Shinites, the Arvitites, the Zemarites, and the Hamathites. Afterwards, the family of the Canaanites were scattered. So the boundary of the Canaanites were from Sidon to Giror, near Gaza. As for Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zeboam, near Lasha, these were the sons of Ham, according to their families, their languages, by their lands and their nations. So the so-called black race came from Ham. But remember, the issue was Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, let's go back just a little bit. What did Noah say? It says, when Noah woke from his wine, he learned what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, curse be Canaan. In this situation, well, you know what happened, ladies and gentlemen, you don't understand? These individuals, Noah and his son, survived the flood. Okay, well, over 365 days in an ark, and they survived the flood. So God went on to bless Noah and his sons and say to them, be fruitful, become many, and fill the earth. Okay, so there were some stories to be told. Campfires, people sitting around, having wonderful conversations. And, of course, the kids would ask, what was it like before the flood? They would be curious, and they would explain to them what it was like before the flood. Well, one of these individuals, hearing about what it was like before the flood, decided to do something. How do we know? Well, let's go. We're going to go to the 19th chapter of Genesis, and we're going to read a story. The two angels arrived in Sodom by evening, and Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. Now, why was Lot sitting at the gate? Anybody? understand why Lot would be sitting at the gate of Sodom? He was a foreigner. He was a guest in Sodom and Gomorrah. He wasn't born there. He was a guest. He moved there. But he's now sitting at the gate. Well, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So when Lot saw them, he got up to meet them, and he bowed down with his face to the earth, and he said to them, please, my lord, turn aside, please, into the house of your servant and stay overnight and have your feet washed. Then you may get up early and travel on your way. Hmm. He's telling them, no, 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 I'll, I'll take care of you. I'll, I'll give you food. I'll give you a place to sleep. Then you guys got to get out of here in the morning as, as soon as possible. Notice what they said. To this they said, no, we will stay overnight in the public square. If you guys didn't understand what this meant, the public square is where all the violence happened. Is where all the stupid stuff happened. This is where individuals were not safe, which is why they were extended hospitality. If you don't believe this, go to the book of Jude, or excuse me, Jude, Judges, and see the situation where the guy whose concubine had gotten raped because they stayed in the town square. Yeah, that wasn't the place to be. So Lot knows this. So note what, it, note, note what happens says, but he was so insistent with them that they went with him into his house and he made a feast for them and he baked unleavened bread and they ate. Okay, happy story. It ends well. But we still got to find out why was Lot at that gate? Well, he was at the gate for the very same reason that he's speaking about here. He didn't want anybody going to that public square. See, that was why he was insistent. Oh, no, no, no. You're not going to the public square over my dead body. So, let's find out if it was really so over his dead body. Then Lot went out. Oh, sorry, we got to read number four. It says, before they could lie down to sleep, men of the city, men of the city of Sodom, the men of Sodom, from boy to old men, all of them surrounded the house in one mob. 
So then they kept on crying out to Lot, or calling out to Lot, and saying to him, Where are the men who came into you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may have sex with them. Excuse me? No, we're not going to read the other part of the story where Lot goes out to plead with them to take his daughters. And what Lot was doing is he wasn't giving up his daughters. Lot already knew the depravity of the men. So he knew that they would definitely not be interested in his daughters, not even the women. But remember, in this situation, there was no reason for women to be there because that's not what was going on here. There were two men. So the men surrounded the house because that was the culture. Just like today, this very same thing that's going on throughout this entire world now, this is the culture. Don't believe me? Go ahead and look at the news, look at television, look at the movies, look at how everybody keeps calling it the culture. I didn't call it that, ladies and gentlemen. They call it a woke culture or this culture or that culture, but they call it a culture because that's what's developing. Now, we said we were going to prove to you that that's where the race started and that slavery started. So let's go back to the ninth chapter because it is very important that we cover this so I can go get some sleep. Ladies and gentlemen, back here at the ninth chapter of Genesis, Noah's sons came out of the ark, who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Look, Japheth and Ham, we know that Japheth is the youngest because this is the way it was written, the youngest always being put in chronological order. So we know Ham was the middle child. It says Ham later became father to Canaan. We don't find anything out here in the ninth chapter about anyone else becoming father to anyone else. Pay attention. Everything is about Ham and Canaan. They start, he's <laughs> right here, the names start to get mentioned. Look, this is the sign of the covenant that I established between you, between me, and all flesh on the earth. So Noah being this prophet, follow me, and we're focusing on Ham and Canaan, no one else. It mentions Shem, Ham, Japheth, but it's Ham, Canaan that keeps getting mentioned. We hear Canaan's name just as much as we hear Shem and Japheth, but we don't hear any other person's name. But Ham, Noah, Japheth, and Shem. But Canaan is constantly mentioned. Look, Got Canaan here, Canaan here. Then we're going to go back here and we got Canaan here. Then we got Canaan here. See, let Canaan become a slave to Shem. I didn't write this, people. This is a prophecy. Let Canaan become a slave to him also. Remember, Canaan, the Canaanites are the individuals of color. I did not write this. This is a prophecy given by Noah. Cursed be Canaan. Now, a lot of people think that when Cain, the son of Adam, killed Abel, that when God cursed Cain, he cursed him by turning him darker skinned, and thus the whole black race was cursed. No. And they had it wrong. They had the right understanding. It was Noah, and he wasn't cursing a race. He was cursing a so-called generation of generation of generation. The descendants of Canaan, not the descendants of Ham. The descendants of Canaan is who he was cursing. Pay attention. Curse be Canaan, and let him become the lowest slave of his brothers. And he added. Praise be Jehovah, the God of Shem, and let Canaan become a slave to him. Let God grant ample, ample space to Jephthah, and he has granted ample space to Jephthah because there is more territory and land that they cover than most other people as far as races and cultures. And let him reside in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan become a slave to him also. So if you didn't understand that it was prophesied, and if you didn't understand the Bible being inspired of God, now you understand. I know some of you are going to have questions. Well, why would he do that? And why would he allow that? That's not fair. And no, 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 no. It was not fair for 
Canaan to go into that room and do what he did. Do we know exactly what he did? No, but we know that it was something sexual. Why? They did not see their father's nakedness. Pay attention. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness. So we know it was something sexual because that's the inference here. And because of that, because he did something sexual to his grandfather, that's just nasty. But that's what he did. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have to now go to where we started so that you can understand the manner. Because remember, from boy to men, they surrounded that house. These descendants of Canaan. So let's do that again. We're going to start in verse number 7. In the same manner, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them also gave themselves over to gross sexual immorality. Loose conduct is what it's going to suggest. Where is the... I can't see the color. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah, shameful conduct. <laughs> it's right here. Shameful conduct. All right, let's get back. And pursued unnatural fleshly desires. And they have been placed before us as a warning example by undergoing judicial punishment of everlasting fire. Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of people have said that homosexuality, people are born with this. That's not the case. This is the junk that was introduced by those creatures who came down. See, it says that they married the women, but you must understand, they weren't just having sex with women. How do we know? Pay attention. Pay attention. In the same manner, Sodom and Gomorrah, wait, same manner of what? And the angels who did not keep their original position in heaven, but forsook their pro own proper dwelling place, he has reserved for internal bonds and dense darkness for the judgment of the great day. Why? Because in the same manner as these angels did prior to the flood, in the same manner, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them also gave themselves over to gross sexual immorality. You see, Sodom and Gomorrah practiced what these angels were practicing. That's how we know before the flood, they introduced homosexuality to man. This is not, I was born this way, and I know there are people who convince themselves that they are born that way, and this is the way they've always been, this is how they feel. Knock yourselves out. I'm only showing you what history shows. I'm only showing you where it came from. Now, there are going to be people who are going to ask, well, what do we do about this? Uh, if it says blacks were supposed to be slaves and blah, blah, blah. I don't believe that. This is not whether you believe it or not. This is something that was written over 4,000 years ago. And it's a reality today. And yes, we can prove it was written over 4,000 years ago. Like I said, some people are not going to like this. I know nobody's ever pointed it out before that I know of. I've never heard it before that people tie things together like this. But all you got to do is go back over every scripture that I just read. Go back over it in every Bible that you got. Every version, every one of them says the same thing. All of them say the same thing. So we know where the enslavement of persons of color comes from. So when I said the other day that the prejudice against people of color is different from the prejudice against other people, other races, you all must understand that I'm not speaking from the standpoint of someone who hates this race or hate that race or blames it on them. It's not their fault. It is Canaan's fault, people, because Canaan did what he did, and he didn't cover it up. He didn't try to hide it. It appears that he went and he told his father. That's why his father, Ham, saw his father's nakedness as well. And he went and told his brothers. He didn't have to tell nobody, everyone. He could have kept that to himself. But Ham decided that he wanted to brag about it. So apparently he got something out of it. Could it have been something going on between Ham and his son? We don't know. But we do know something happened. That wasn't right. 
Gotta go. 30 minutes.